Good afternoon. I'm Sam Brannan, and I am the director of the Risk and Foresight Group and a senior fellow in the International Security Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I'm also joined uh, from London by Yasmin Serhan. And today we are going to discuss uh, our respective uh, research on uh, global mass protests and particularly winding back the clock, in my case, from 2009 through 2019 and looking at the evolution of protests during that time period. And Yasmin will discuss uh, where protests have gone in the COVID era, and then we will jointly think about where they might go uh, in months and years to come. Uh, so without further ado, let me share uh, my screen here, attempt to do that, and um, share with you uh, another element of our presentation today, uh, which is that we will be taking live questions from you, uh, and you can submit those online. We'll, we'll get to those at the end of our discussion here, about uh, 30 minutes in. And you can go either to the live event page on the CSIS website, or you can look at the YouTube page and there's a link there. So hopefully those are uh, self-explanatory and, and please feel free to send those questions in as you have them on a, on a rolling basis and we'll get to them at the conclusion of remarks. Um, so the operative question, uh, which I think I've already somewhat answered and you probably have in your own minds as well, is will COVID-19 mark the end of mass protests? Um, and let me go back to the beginning of why I started following mass protests. I'm sure a number of you noted at the end of 2019 that something very unusual appeared to be going on around the world in the number, the frequency, and the scale of protests that we saw across any number of country types. And that actually uh, brought to mind uh, a quote from uh, our late colleague here at CSIS, one of the smartest people I've ever worked with, spoken with, Zbigniew Brzezinski, Jimmy Carter's former national security advisor, who observed in 2008, this is when he wrote these words, it was ahead of the Arab Spring and, and other large scale events, but that the world seemed to be in the midst of what he called a global political awakening. And so with access to information technology, with knowledge of politics came rising expectations from citizens around the world. And so at the end of 2019, we actually decided to look backward and to look back at the data from the end of the global financial crisis, <laughs> just so happened to be from 2009 through 2019, and look at um, this issue of, is this actually, is 2019 aberrant or was it part of a, a broader trend? And what we saw, obviously, not it's not a, a clean uh, regression here. Uh, there are peaks and valleys, but in regions around the world, we saw a rise in protests during this time period. And we've called out some of the largest scale events here um, that, that come to mind. This is actually courtesy of The Economist who did a, a very nice job using our, our data. Uh, but this is a rising trend in regions around the world and again in regime types. So the 114 countries that experienced protests in 2019, that was actually part of a rising trend. So in fact, if you look at the Arab Spring here, it's not even the high point in terms of the level of protest during the past decade. Our methodology, just a, a brief note uh, also to, to plug the great data that an online tool, online database GDELT has put together. A lot of people cite the ACLID data. GDELT is actually a larger database, covers more countries in more languages. And we were able to pull out political protests specifically uh, in looking at their, at their data. And uh, to visualize it another way, this is what we found. So if you took what would some would call a compound annual growth rate. Uh, we just called it the annual uh, average rate of growth. You can see that 11.5% uh, uh, rise globally over this time period, but some notable um, bumps to that are uh, not surprisingly 16.5% in the Middle East and in North Africa. Uh, highest rate of protest growth during this period, 23.8% in Sub-Saharan Africa and 17% in North America. Um, and during this period, uh, when we compare to levels of protests we've seen in other mass protest eras, such as the 1980s or the 1990s, even the late 1960s, those do not compare in scale to what we've seen over the past decade repeatedly across countries and, and regions. And so just another way to visualize the, the data here again, sometimes it's up and, and down, it's sporadic, driven by local political events, uh, 
certainly we don't see some mass hidden hand coordinating these things. These are all sui generis. We'll get into the what they share in the next slide, though. So the number one issue driving global protests, in our opinion, information communication technology, the ease with which one can create a network around a political issue, activate a large number of people, get them out onto the streets, relatively anonymous way to do it increasingly, um, relatively risk-free way to communicate uh, through encrypted means and otherwise. Number two issue, rising perceptions of inequality and corruption. When we actually looked at the core drivers of protests across many countries, that's the theme that came up again and again. So it's, it's perceptions. People know more that they're not getting what they think they should get relative to elites and others who control their countries. Number three, cities and urbanizations. The locus of many of these protests, not all of them, but many of them has been within cities, within urban areas. Again, the ability to sort of quickly gather people for a protest easier in that environment. And fourth, global youth and underemployment. Uh, I, I think it's about 42% of the world's population is under the age of 24. So there is this rising youth cohort, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, places where we see that really large scale um, growth in, in, uh, in protests, increasing access to education among youth and an increasing sense that they are unemployed or underemployed unfairly, uh, given what they think should be possible within their uh, societies. Environmental stress and climate change, another major driver, particularly in the past few years. Um, groups like uh, Extinction Rebellion uh, basically grew overnight to multi-million person movements across multiple countries, coordinating at scales we haven't seen before, larger than Vietnam era war protests, larger than Iraq protests, other transnational protests we've seen. And so the scale of these things continues to accelerate. Um, literacy and education, again, that um, ability about 4 billion of the earth's uh, so uh, just under 8 billion people are now online they're able to read they're able to communicate and again they have more insight into what's going on to their politics or uh, at least they think they have more insight into what's going on to their politics more mobilized around politics and there's also clearly a contagion effect in, in, in place here. So in other mass protest area, we've, we've seen this as well. So one protest begets other protests um, and exchange of so-called best practices, we might say. So Hong Kong protesters uh, were very effective at garnering big media attention by going to the airport, by blockading the airport. That was mirrored very quickly in uh, Barcelona by Catalonian separatist protesters. We see a lot of that exchange of knowledge, uh, even exchange of information, pamphlets of, of how-tos to diffuse tear gas, all kinds of tactics uh, that are being exchanged between protesters. There's also a community uh, that overlaps with what uh, the, the Trump administration has called great power competition. And that is that we, in the course of this research, I didn't go looking for this, but it became very apparent in looking at core drivers who was involved in protests internationally, that Russia, China, Iran, um, and the United States to a lesser degree are very uh, interwoven with, with protests. So for Russia, China, and Iran, their focus is first and foremost on preventing political dissent in their own countries, but other times using protest movements in their own countries and abroad to achieve political objectives. And increasingly, we can see in their foreign policy behavior and their statements, there is a real focus on um, number one uh, sort of advertising in effect, uh, almost rent an authoritarianism service, advising other regimes and governments on how to repress protesters, including uh, at the digital level. Uh, Russia in its Africa summit that it held last year, one of the big things that it rolled forward to a number of governments in Africa was basically a willingness to do what it takes to keep your control on power. Everything from uh, using sort of troll farms and um, other approaches uh, to uh, to uh, even the uh, the sharing of mercenaries. Uh, you can look at a Syria-like approach that that rose from sort of a reaction to protest movements all the way to military force. Um, 
And finally, with the United States, uh, we there is a special role the United States has played in political protests. First of all, because many people believe, whether it's true or not, and mostly it's not true, that the United States is behind protest movements, and especially Russia, China, and Iran have this belief that that's the case. Um, and in other cases, there's simply a great value in what the United States says, not only to protesters in terms of supporting democratic values, but more so in, in many cases to sort of keeping the regime on notice that the United States is watching and that there are certain li lines being driven. So there's a, a special role for the United States. In uh, Additionally, in tech policy, a lot of the platforms and tools that are being used by protesters are US origin, which is actually why China, Russia, and Iran are so interested in creating internet fragmentation and creating their own tools and, and ways to control. So there's really an offense, defense, protesters versus each other, even US versus these three countries dynamic that's playing out globally. Um, so before I turn it over to, to Yasmin here, uh, let me just note that our analysis ended, as I said, at the end of 2019. Clearly, a lot has happened since. A lot has happened since we released this report at the beginning of March 2019. We were in the office at the time. Uh, none of us expected things to go quite the way that they have. Um, but we believe that the core drivers that we identified in our uh, study carry through and, in fact, have in some ways accelerated in the present. So obviously, public health concerns regulations, uh, a variety of reasons why we why we are not seeing mass protests, and we'll get to that in a second now, at the level we were before. Um, but issues like income inequality, like views of uh, whether the government can or cannot deliver to meet citizen expectations, all of those have sort of spiked in the current environment. They are, they are accelerating, they're not decelerating. So the idea that the protests will lose steam or lose oxygen is, is not one that I think is true. Second, a lot of these protesters, and yes, me will talk to this, have really returned to their digital roots. These are digital first organizations. And so for them to go to digital footing, isn't as big a deal as one might think. And also youth protesters, very familiar with living online with social distancing of a different sort. So there's a lot of resilience built in there. Um, and again, extraordinary economics and, and politics of, of the current age. Um, when a uh, number of people are being asked to make the kind of individual sacrifice or choices that they're making when they're losing their jobs, their expectations that um, their issues, their grievances will be dealt with in the same seriousness as COVID has is through the roof. And we see this particularly in the environmental protest community, but we see it in a lot of other areas as well. And fourth, uh, intersection is authoritarian opportunism. So I think there's also very clear evidence that a number of countries, whether it's Hungary, whether it's China in the Hong Kong case, um, whether it is uh, Russia in a Moscow case, um, whether it is Iran in, in the case of uh, putting down uh, protests that, that arose late last year, early this year on various issues, see this as an opportunity to sort of reset uh, with protesters gaining the upper hand. Um, so whether it's putting into place digital surveillance tools in the name of COVID surveillance that might have application to cracking down on protesters in the future, or whether it's putting into place rules and regulations on public gatherings that they will be uh, not very keen to lift in the long term. Those are issues to watch. Um, just uh, recent data. This is from ACLID, which I, I don't mean to uh, cast aspersions on ACLID. It's a, it's a fantastic resource uh, for researchers, and um, it's just a little bit less comprehensive for what we were looking at on a really global level. But if you look, clear uh, drop-off in protests, Middle East and North Africa, clear in India as well, where there have been strong lockdowns, um, but actually a rise during this period in uh, Brazil. Uh, so the Bolsonaro government's response to COVID has been very unpopular. A lot of people protesting both publicly and privately against the government. Um, and I should note that these protest incidents in both data sets are related to media coverage. So a key element here is the media reflecting what they're seeing in the streets. And um, yes, me and I will go into that uh, a little bit more. Um, so finally, just a few key considerations to, to throw out for policymakers um, in terms of uh, having identified the problem, offering some ideas of what to do. The first is I think the United States really needs uh, a clearer theory of the case when it comes to global protests. I was working in the Pentagon on the Turkey desk in the midst of the Arab Spring and recall that as each country 
uh, in the Arab Spring sort of protests ramped up, they were really treated one at a time. There wasn't a theory of the case of what's going on here. There was discussion about it, but there wasn't sort of a clear application of the same principles across countries. And I would argue that then uh, it would have been useful to have been a little bit clearer on articulation of, of values and, and more consistent in policy across those countries. And I think today the same thing is true. U.S. policymakers as a protest pops up in any given country should have a bit of a checklist that they can go down um, and assess what's going on in that country, whether it's something where the U.S. should um, in some way be engaged politically, diplomatically through foreign assistance uh, or not, and um, what it should articulate on those things. And that goes to the second issue, which is values, which I think um, protest movements are in many cases articulating a sort of pushback to the rise of global authoritarianism. So as uh, Freedom House released its most recent report, we've had 14 straight years of democratic decline across the world. Um, these are important events for people to express their political opinions in the street. Um, they support the values that we support as a democratic country, that Europeans support as democracies. And so thinking about how we articulate those values to, to protesters is important in social movements more broadly. Finally, digital and physical resilience. Uh, and here, as I said, authoritarian regimes clearly see an opportunity um, to push back on democracies now and, uh, and in democratic movements and legitimate social movements within countries. Um, and so the United States and, and others should think about what they can do to help with digital and physical resilience of these movements while they're under pressure in the COVID era. So with that, I will um, turn it over to Yasmin. I will again remind you, uh, please submit questions online in either of these forms. Thanks so much, Yasmin. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, that was a really fascinating presentation. I look forward to kind of jumping off of that. I think it sets a really good foundation um, for what we've kind of been seeing since 2019. Um, so just, um, I guess, as a matter of introduction, um, I'm, I'm a staff writer based in London for The Atlantic. And for the better part of the last year, um, I've been following these mass global protests uh, that Sam just outlined. Um, and I was really struck by, you know, all the commonalities, uh, many of which he touched on, you know, the fact that a lot of these were grassroots movements. These were movements that didn't have, um, in many cases, a clearly anointed leader, which was often by design, made them less, or I should say, more difficult to repress. Um, you know, these were movements that really used social media to amplify their message, to organize. Um, and these were movements that really had staying power and really seemed unstoppable, um, kind of coming up to 2020. Obviously, then the coronavirus came, and um, it, I was sort of under the impression that you know, what with the lockdowns coming into place that many of these movements would lose their momentum. Um, but upon doing some reporting on this subject and speaking to people like Sam, I actually realized the opposite was true, that the pandemic didn't spell the end of mass protests, but rather it simply changed them. Um, and I'll run through a number of examples of the protests I've seen that sort of em emphasize that point. Um, it, Brazil was one that Sam mentioned, um, you know, it's easily one, I think the top 10 worst affected countries, at least in terms of confirmed coronavirus cases in the world right now. And we've seen the frustration with that and with the government's response manifested in millions of Brazilians taking to their windows or their balconies, banging pots and pans as a way of sort of voicing their discontent uh, for, for President Bolsonaro's handling um, of the coronavirus. Um, he's sort of led the sort of coronavirus denial movement um, among leaders in the world, he's likened it to a little flu and has even joined um, protests against the lockdown. Um, it's worth mentioning that unlike the protests um, uh, against the government, these protests don't necessarily follow social distancing guidelines. Um, but that's been one example that we've seen of people trying to be innovative, trying to abide by the lockdown rules in their respective countries, but doing so from a safe place. And in this case, the comfort of their own homes. Um, Elsewhere around the world, Lebanon, um, we've seen the continuation of the anti-corruption protests that started last year. Um, only now, instead of people taking to the streets um, as they would have normally done, they're doing so in their vehicles. Um, so this has kind of, again, been a way of, of people still sort of, you know, prote protesting against the government, making their concerns known, many concerns, which I think as Sam rightly noted, haven't gone away because of the virus, if anything, have been amplified. Um, and are, are finding a safe way to do it there. Um, in Israel, we've seen mass protests manifest themselves in a couple of interesting ways, both um, in, in real life on the street, but also virtually. Um, 
last month, there was a really stunning image um, from Tel Aviv in Rabin Square, um, where around, I think, 2,000 protesters gathered to, um, to basically demonstrate against President Benjamin Netanyahu's government, uh, pardon me, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's government. Um, but they did so in a socially distanced way. They were all separated six feet apart. They were all wearing masks. It was coordinated with the police. Um, and interestingly enough, it sort of gave the impression of a much larger protest. Um, for those who aren't familiar with Rabin Square, it can accommodate tens of thousands of protests, or tens of thousands of people, I should say, um, you know, in, in a normal protest. So this one, though with less people, did seem quite big because they had taken up the whole square. But, um, you know, we've also seen virtually, virtual rallies uh, take place in Israel. Um, over, over the government and its handling of the crisis. Uh, one which um, occurred over Facebook Live um, attracted quite a few viewers. Um, similarly, as, as Sam noted, the climate change movement has also found digital refuge. Um, I know that last month for Earth Day, we saw that they uh, staged a global digital mobilization, which featured not just panels, but music performances, basically a way of sort of kind of trying to maintain that momentum and still get their views and point across but in a safe way. And um, Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg has also encouraged her followers to adapt to the new circumstances by shifting to online strikes as well. Um, let me see. Uh, and then finally, of course, um, one of the biggest examples of uh, protest movements uh, this past year we saw in Hong Kong, um, where the large scale rallies that we've seen uh, for much of the past year were put on hiatus uh, very quickly after the first cases started emerging in the country. Um, instead, they kind of pivoted online, which was already sort of a comfortable spot. It was how they organized um, their, their protests, it was how they communicated, often through encrypted messaging. Um, and they would do things like, you know, do online petitions, host virtual events. Um, the organizers I spoke to were really, um, found it really important to note that they didn't see these sort of virtual manifestations of protest as a perfect replacement for real life street protests. Uh, but they did see it as an important way of maintaining momentum until they can resume protests. And many are hoping that they will be able to um, by June, which is when they will be celebrating their anniversary. Um, in fact, though we've, we've already seen um, some resumption of those protests um, just this week, though we can talk about that at a later time. I, I think something that I kind of discovered in my reporting, just looking, stepping back broadly from all these examples I've outlined, is that um, there are obviously pros and cons. Um, to the sort of digital ad adaptation that we're seeing around the world. Um, the obvious pros is that, you know, these protests aren't geographically confined anymore. Um, you know, a, a protest can span an entire city, an entire country, or even the globe, depending on who's tuning in. Um, they don't need to, you know, seek, seek out uh, permits to assemble as you might otherwise normally do. Um, and nor do they have to worry about police crackdowns, particularly in places like Hong Kong um, and Iraq, where, where obviously uh, those were those were quite, um, quite, yeah, just quite frequent um, and obviously covered very widely. Um, the, the obvious disadvantages, I think, is that obviously online protests don't have the same physical impact um, that street protests do. Um, you know, a, a, a campaign by Extinction Rebellion can't tangibly disrupt the way they did this just this past year in London, um, you know, kind of camping out in um, street intersections or disrupting public transport the way that they could if they were online. Um, also, if you know, if protesters aren't physically out there, there's less of an incentive, I think, for governments to respond. Um, you know, it's a lot more pressing if protesters are on your doorstep outside a government building than say if perhaps they're just you know uh, having a sort of virtual rally. Um, and, and I think kind of related to that, they're also unlikely to attract the same level of press coverage. Also. Um, um, I, I think one point that I'll probably end on is that um, obviously going digital isn't a panacea, though, as Sam rightly mentioned, many of these protests, particularly those that um, are kind of pushed by a younger generation, they're already online, they know how to do this. But um, for some places, such as Algeria, where um, you know, street protest has been the dominant form of protest. This lockdown has been quite difficult. And um, as Sam mentioned also, the, the fact that, you know, some governments have sort of taken advantage of this situation to sort of quell protests has also been a challenge that some movements have had to face. Um, in Algeria, they've been having twice weekly street protests um, against the uh, 
military-backed regime for the better part of the last year up until March when they self-elected um, to stop those protests um, in order to comply with lockdown measures. Now the Algerian government has banned protests for a year. So, you know, it, it's up in the air how that movement will kind of go forward even after um, this pandemic has passed. And, you know, we've seen similar steps taken in Hungary where Viktor Orban has um, sort of given himself uh, uh, or has passed legislation that allows him to rule by decree indefinitely. Uh, so he has the power to prevent public demonstrations in the Philippines. President Rodrigo Duterte has authorized a shoot to kill order uh, for anyone violating lockdown measures, including would be protesters. Um, so I think this is definitely kind of a concern that um, protest movements will be kind of contending with, um, particularly as I, as, as I said before, I mean, a lot of the concerns that these movements have been facing haven't gone away um, in, in many parts of the world. You know, this whole crisis has sort of amplified them further. We're already starting to see in Lebanon, where, as I mentioned, was an example of protesters sort of adapting to the circumstances. We're already starting to see some trickles of people defying lockdown orders because they feel like they don't have a choice. Um, so, yeah, I think, um, you know, th there are a lot of really Im immense examples and we're going to we're going to see more and more, I think, um, obviously, as the weeks and months go on. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll probably leave it at that for now, and I'm sure we'll get into it in the discussion. Thank you, yes, me, and that's a superb overview uh, and and catching us up to to the present. Let me first apologize; I was sharing the wrong screen. I'm told so you all saw a very tiny version of the slides. We will post them online, and I'm sure we can figure out how to fix that on the the web video. Uh, I turned 40 during quarantine, and apparently that's old enough to no longer be able to use technology effectively. So apologies for that. Um, we are joined on the on the uh, line by uh, Michael McCabe uh, from USAID. I, I noted that he was going to be on today, and asked him if he wouldn't mind uh, before we go over to the the uh, the questions that we've been collecting, just sharing a, a few of his his own uh, thoughts. Just just speaking as a uh, as an attendee here today. Mike, are you on the line? Yes, thanks so much, Sam and Yasmin, for your great presentation on the dynamics of protests and social movements, not only over the past decade, but more importantly, how this landscape's really quickly changing with the current circumstances and the aftershocks of COVID. Um, I think we're all seeing daily how the many protests and social movements have been adapting to COVID-related restrictions, as well as adding both health, economic, and other related concerns to their list of grievances or concerns. And so one thing's for sure that protesters and, and these movements have learned to adapt using technology in all for, sorts of new creative ways, whether it's the virtual murals, the car protests, the online pro-democracy games or tactics, um, as well as how they're delivering food and being part of the solution for those who are needy, whether it's in Lebanon or others, just as governments have also taken advantage of of the lockdown time to um, adapt their tools. Um, I think you know one of the things we're looking at really closely is not only how COVID uh, health-related issues oh. are impacting a lot of outcomes, but the secondary impacts um, that we're seeing already that can be really worrisome in the coming year and the coming month, in particular for young people, the issue I work on a lot, um, issues impacting children, youth, and marginalized groups in terms of really high numbers where nine out of 10 young people are out of school and many may not return to school to help their family out with income insecurity needs or um, growing numbers of unemployed youth or who are income insecure um, where they already have two to three times the the rate of unemployment of the general population so combining that out of school out of work uh, along with the frustrations of the inability of some governments to, to meet those basic needs in the, the time frame that citizens expect could lead to um, even higher numbers of, of protests as, as countries start opening back up. Um, we're looking at some new and effective ways to really authentically engage young people in particular as partners in development. We think that that's part of the solution is creating this continuum of civic education, civic engagement, leadership development, for young people to find their sense of voice in communities um, in around these issues that you've highlighted, whether it's on, on climate or health or education or employment. And in countries like Kosovo or Guatemala or other places, we've been able to work over the past few years on a continuum of engagement for civic solutions. We think that's part of 
that, that solution, as well as ensuring protection for those who are out in public demonstrations to ensure their, their rights are, are protected. So I guess my, my big question for, for both of you um, as we're kicking off the Q&A part is, what stays and what goes in terms of how we understand the lessons of the past decade um, in this, this new context for especially you know, the coming, coming year ahead of us? And two, as you mentioned, sometimes voicing support from outside governments or donors isn't always welcome or useful for protesters. So what's the single most important thing that you think that donors or US government partners should be doing to positively influence um, protest movements and social movements? Mike, thanks for your comments and, and good good question. Um, yes, I mean, do you, do you wanna tackle uh, either either of those first? And Yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, those are great questions. Thank you, Michael. And I think actually, I, I don't mind tackling that second one. Um, the, the immediate example that, that came to mind um, was the Iran protests of last year where um, we had protesters um, protesting the government. Um, and and I, as, I, as I recall, um, Donald Trump had effectively sent um, quite a brief message to the Iranian regime was, which was, do not kill your protesters. And it, um, it came as sort of, you know, a ta obviously a tacit message of support um, for, for the protests against the government. But um, Sam, I think as you mentioned in your earlier remarks, uh, you know, there, there are countries out there um, that, that obviously, you know, or, or governments, I should say, that their message is obviously that the U.S. is behind some of these movements. Um, so, so I think something that's kind of important to, to bear in mind when you, you know, if you're the U.S. in this case or any government is, you know, how your support for a protest will be perceived um, and how um, the governments that, that are the subjects of those protests might um, flip the narrative or, or use that narrative to sort of fuel their own perceptions of, of the protests. So in this case, I, I think we saw, you know, very quickly that the, the, the Iranian government was effectively able to say, oh, look, see, this is the US supporting this protest or, or making claims, making, effectively making claims to undermine the protests. So even if it's, you know, a protest, which I think in this case was quite leaderless, this was kind of another example of, you know, making it quite easy to repress by sort of pinning it on one figure that they can, that they can target. And, and let me actually pick up on the first part of your question, Mike, and then what Yasmin just said about leaderlessness of the movement. So what did we learn over the past decade? I think it is the sort of Brzezinski observation that the perceptions of your average citizen globally have changed of what they expect from government, of what they think government should do to them or for them, uh, not do them. Um, and there, there's a gap, and I think in many countries there's a growing gap between um, what people want and what governments are able to provide. Uh, I think part of it is that expectations probably can't be met at a certain level. So, um, you know, there, there, that is going to be a challenge, and that's something that that unscrupulous politicians, populists, and others can exploit, which is just sort of the feeling that you're not getting yours, um, even without offering sort of how you could do that. Just tapping into that raw emotion has become a political force. Um, the the other piece, though, is that there probably is a need for governments, democracies, all kinds of governments to change and and to innovate. Um, and I think, you know, there are some small country examples where this happens on a much more continuous basis in New Zealand or Singapore or a UAE or, um, you know, I think economically advantaged countries have a lot more ability to sort of rapidly adjust. But I think we see policy innovation at local levels in states at sub at supranational levels across the continent of Africa there are interesting things that happen um, and so governance needs to needs to change needs to adapt um, but I think you know the 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 sort of the flip side of that is that there is a danger of when people are in the streets they're going to be in the streets again and so you know how do you convert that street energy into political movements into political parties which we see in decline in so many countries how do you take um, how do you take the power of people marching in the street and make them sort of channel that into productive political um, channels make new political parties in some cases um, that that is a big challenge the sort of the the death 
breadth of democracy by its inefficiency, um, by the failure to translate sort of energy into outcomes. Um, so let me turn to uh, some of the the questions that uh, that we've gotten here. We have some 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 tough uh, questions from the audience. Tough as in uh, good questions that are going to be tough for us to answer. Let me let me start with this one um, from Teresa. Um, do you believe that individuals' freedom of speech can be hampered more easily during virtual protests? And do you believe that police crackdowns will be translated into state actors preventing protests via uh, electronic means? So um, sort of our, our state, our protests as effective uh, during COVID and will governments um, use COVID as a way to further suppress protests? And Yasmin, you, you touched on this a bit before, but you want to take that? Yeah, absolutely. And no, I think that's a great question. And, and I think the answer is that it probably depends um, on the country where the protests are taking place. I mean, certainly there are examples um, you know, of, of, of governments that do have the power to sort of shut down the internet at will, um, often more authoritarian or autocratic countries. Um, so obviously in those sort of places or in those sort of contexts, the digital realm isn't always a refuge. Um, and particularly if it's a scenario where you know, encrypted communication isn't as easily accessed or, you know, uh, internet curtailed. I, I think that does pose a challenge. And it's kind of, a, I think, again, one of the, one of the sort of cons of, uh, of only having the online realm to go to for protests is that it isn't as equally accessed everywhere in the world. Um, you know, in, in countries where obviously the internet is free to access, um, then yeah, I mean, of course, you know, then, then you know, people will, won't have a problem with that. Um, but yeah, I do, I do think that that's important discrepancy that will, will become in, increasingly more of an issue, particularly as long as this continues. Great, and I'm gonna roll up a couple of questions together here. Um, one that is from Emir Han and one that's from Evan. Uh, Emir Han asks about um, whether um, basically, there is the collective action theory shows that the puzzles at the individual level, why do people take part in protests when there are costs involved, uh, when their own participation could bring little benefit? Does it change in terms of COVID? So that sort of personal risk calculus and risk re reward, does it change? Um, and then a related question I would say is, um, as social distancing measures are eased, as it becomes safer or at least more accepted to go out in public, how will frustration with government handling of the COVID crisis itself, health system inadequacy, abuses and curfews, corruption, mismanagement in COVID-related support, reinforce COVID-related economic effects to fuel a new wave of, of protests? And I'll, I'll just answer first on, on that and, and turn it over to Yasmin. So I think um, the risk-reward calculus has actually been quite favorable in mass protests recently. It depends on what country you're in. If you're in Iran, they're shooting people in the street. Um, if you are in Hong Kong, um, you are relying on encrypted communications and there are enough of you out up to a quarter of the city that there's really no individual retribution that can take place. Um, and the again, this sort of move to leaderless I should say, is really rooted in the Hong Kong protester community, which is a source of sort of best practices and inspiration. After the 2013 to 14 umbrella protests, the Hong Kong police, special police, went after the notes of that protest. Um, so the Hong Kong protesters went back to basically classic social movement, protest movement literature, and they adopted this leaderless, I mean, it's actually, you know, sort of guerrilla Maoist tactics, if you will, um, leaderless approach um, where you're no longer dependent on nodes. Every individual becomes their own sort of node in the protest movement. And that has been very challenging for um, the Chinese Communist Party to, to deal with because you can't extinguish it by single arrests. Um, so, so I think you know the whether whether that changes. Uh, so, some of the technologies that are being adopted now, from an epidemiological sort of tracking point of view, these Bluetooth apps that establish who you've come into contact with, who you may have given COVID to, also map your social network. Um, and so, using that data you can start to figure out who are maybe the more important among the protest movement, who are the influencers, um, even if they sort of keep that hidden online and, in, and through encrypted channels. So there are some real risks that some of these technologies may have negative spillover, um, even as they have public health purpose. Um, and then on the, the question about, you know, sort of the COVID 
begetting new crisis waves. I think it's absolutely, I mean, it's happening. It's happening in the United States from a lockdown economic perspective. Um, it's happening elsewhere for that same reason. A lot of food security related protest movements um, in, in Africa, South Asia. Um, so you're, you're seeing it. And I, I do think um, in Brazil and, and elsewhere, you've seen protests again uh, over the handling or mishandling from a public health perspective. Yes, mean, do you want to tag on to either of those? Yeah, I mean, I think I'll, is, I'll echo kind of, I thought, yeah, you covered it kind of very clearly in both answers, but I think it definitely on the second point, I think what we've seen, and, and I know when I spoke to organizers in Hong Kong about this, um, one of them predicted, when I, I think I spoke to him about a month ago, that, you know, that the frustration um, with how the Hong Kong government was handling the coronavirus alone would sort of be an impetus for further protests. So they were, you know, they were quite keen to get back out there for that very reason. So I think if anything, yet yeah, the moment these measures start to, to, to sort of ease up a bit. I think, you know, I don't think people um, will, will think twice about um, going out. I mean, they may well think about, you know, uh, perhaps wearing face masks. I mean, in Hong Kong, it was adopted originally to sort of obscure who they were, but now there's a, there's a safety element as well. Um, I, I think, you know, people might try to, I know in Lebanon where we've seen some people defy um, the lockdown measures, people are still wearing face masks and, you know, protective gear. They're still kind of mindful of the fact that there's a risk there. But as, as one uh, gentleman put it um, in a report that I was watching, you know, that the, this is a matter of going hungry, that there are just some issues that, you know, were separate from the protests, but have been, or, sorry, separate from the pandemic, but have been amplified by them um, that are just too big not to go out. So um, I definitely think we'll, we'll be seeing more protests, um, either continuing off the concerns prior to COVID-19, but also kind of off the back of COVID-19, uh, we may just see a slightly altered way uh, that protesters decide to perform them. And yes, I mean, let me ask a question that reflects a, a number of the questions here um, uh, on the media's role in sort of amplifying protesters, making protests so politically attractive, given, uh, for instance, uh, again, referencing the U.S. domestic environment, there it was, you know, maybe a few dozen uh, sort of lockdown protesters who converged on various state capitals over past weeks, garnered an unbelievable amount of media attention. Uh, this is an outlier view by all uh, public polling that I've seen. People actually support economic lockdown, do, don't want it to be lifted prematurely. But the dialogue shifted sharply in the United States based on the presence of these protesters um, who appear to have been not self-organized in many cases, but uh, part of sort of larger political movements that were tied into more conventional politics in, in the United States. So clearly the sort of use of protests in the midst of COVID to be a political messaging tool is important. Um, as, as, as you watch from sort of a, a media lens, what's the right way to cover protests? Um, how, how do you keep them in context? How, um, how sensationalist uh, do we risk becoming about protests when they gather so much public attention? No, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and I wish I had the perfect answer. But, you know, I think the reason that the media would, would be inclined to, to latch on um, to, to, to some of these protests as they're occurring is twofold. I mean, I think the first is that, um, you know, as you, you know, the whole reason we're talking about this subject is that it's part of a broader global trend. Um, it's something that we've been following for the last year. And I think when we see kind of another iteration of that appear, particularly in a context such as this, there is an inclination to, to basically include that in the narrative and to cover it. Um, but the second thing I think is that it's because, you know, because we're all stuck out inside um, or um, but because of the circumstances we're in, that when something does happen outside, that particularly something that often is, you know, defying the rules that have been put in place to sort of curb this virus to spread. Um, I, I think it's regarded as a big deal and as something that, you know, that, that needs to be drawn attention to. But I, but I think you're right. I think there is, you know, particularly in cases where, you know, there aren't that many people, um, there is a risk of sort of over inflating the impact or the importance of some of these protests. Um, you know, I thought there was a great example here in the UK um, that the lockdown protests here, at least as far as I've been aware, haven't been nearly as big or as prominent as they have been in the US. Um, there was a, a write-up of one such anti-lockdown protest in the Times of London, in which the reporter noted that there were seven people at Trafalgar Square um, and that her presence had doubled their numbers. So, you know, I mean, I think there's a way of writing about this that can convey, you know, 
how big a protest is or whether it's not big at all. And that, you know, in and of itself is news, the fact that, you know, I, I think covering that in that way and saying, look, you know, by and large, as you say, these lockdown measures are something that the public are widely behind. It's something that they're concerned about. So I think there are ways of covering it, bringing attention to the fact that these things are happening without necessarily sensationalizing the fact that they're happening at all. Um, I hope that was an answer and not a complete dodge. But, um, but no, I, I think, think I think that was a uh, that was an answer, and uh, we have uh, come to the the balance of our our time here. Uh, I think obviously an evolving issue, lots of outcomes, lots of um, changes by by the day, um, lots of evolution in protester thinking, um, and lots of issues for policymakers and in, in all capitals to to think about, even as they're dealing with these big issues. This is an important one as well, and it will be not only with us, but it will be back possibly with a vengeance uh, in in months and in years ahead. So I hope we can check back in with you sometime soon on this, Yasmin. And thanks so much for for joining us, all of you online uh, around the world. Thanks, everybody. Be well. Thank you.